Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today called Active Living with MS, empowering people with multiple sclerosis to actively improve their balance and gait. Next slide, please. My name is Mandy Shintani, and I, I am an occupational therapist and gerontologist by background. I'll be your host of the webinar for today. In 2005, we developed specialized Nordic walking poles called the activator poles, specifically for rehabilitation. It was through our company called Urban Poling Inc. And I am coming to you from Vancouver, Canada. I'm very excited today because we have a guest speaker. It is uh, Dr. Stephen Cantor, and he's coming from New York. And I'll let him uh, tell you a little bit about his background. Thank you, Mandy. Good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Dr. Stephen Cantor. Uh, you could see on the screen a little bit about myself. And yes, I'm here about 3,500 miles east of where Mandy is. And uh, again, I appreciate your time tonight coming out and listening to us. Uh, tonight, we're gonna speak about how I've incorporated the activator poles into my practice with people with MS. And as you can see, one of my primary responsibilities is as Director of Rehabilitation Services at the International MS Management Practice. And I have the fortunate opportunity to see people with MS and also fortunate to have the ability to incorporate the activator poles in their balance and gait program, most of what, uh, much of what I'll be speaking about tonight. So let's move on here. So when I see pa people with MS, often I will look at a patient who has any type of walking disorders, mobility disorders, and start immediately thinking about the balance system and how to address the potential for falls and fall prevention. I look at their gait and consider how their gait may be limited. And there are several studies that suggest that the biggest complaint that people with MS have is gait dysfunction, limitations in walking. So I get right to those main areas of, of, of physical therapy evaluation and physical therapy treatment. With an occupational therapist, I'll incorporate social integration and address the common symptom of neurogenic fatigue and how a patient may be limited in their ADLs or IADLs because we do want to improve their quality of life. We want to make sure that the quality of life can not only remain the same because they have MS, but potentially re recover some of the functions that they may have lost. Now, when it comes to strength and flexibility training, this is something that all patients should be treated, regardless of whether they have MS or not. Unfortunately, many physical and occupational therapists will start with strength and flexibility as the foundation to physical therapy or occupational therapy for people with MS. And I think that's a mistake because often a patient will either be prematurely discharged or a patient will get frustrated because they won't feel like their strength is improving. So it brings me back to the idea of getting their balance and gait addressed and addressed early. Now, patients with MS may have other symptoms as well, which are common, including spasticity, uh, impairments, bowel and bladder dysfunction, speech language pathology, may address speech and swallowing and potentially cognitive issues along with an occupational therapist. And of course, pain management can be an issue in MS or because of an orthopedic side effect. And then pressure sore prevention and management also would need to be addressed. But we're gonna to focus today primarily on gait and balance and how to incorporate that into an overall rehab program for a person with MS with considering the activator poles as a modality to use. So I speak about treating patients with neuromotor exercises, which is a little different than musculoskeletal exercises because the immediate purpose is to improve the neuromotor system. And it, to me, it starts with balance and ambulatory functional abilities. Things that they do in a weight bearing situation, if a patient with MS is able to stand, I get them to stand. 
if they're not able to stand, then we do focus as much as we can on upright sitting, but sometimes I'll even put them in a standing frame or something to get them supported upright. But it is important that they're not just doing all their exercises laying on their back or just sitting down. Now, this Venn diagram is showing the link between balance and ambulatory abilities. And I come back to strength and flexibility because I don't want you to think that it's not important and that I don't address it. I think it's very important that a, a person with MS is on a strengthening program and definitely on a program that incorporates uh, improving flexibility of the joints and muscles. As a matter of fact, the main element of all my exercise program includes stretching, the most important by far. And there were patients today that I even spoke with who I explained to them, if you're gonna do anything right now during this time when we're stuck at home, it will be that you do your stretching and then after you do your stretching, then you can start working on all the other exercises I've prescribed. So I didn't want to make it sound like strength and flexibility wasn't important. I just wanted to make sure that uh, the people who have MS who are on this webinar or clinicians who are also on this webinar understand that balance needs to be addressed early um, and aggressively. Mandy? Thank you, Stephen. Uh, now what I'd like to do is talk to you about, well, what is the concept of Nordic walking? We've coined it here in Canada as urban polling. So it really is a fitness activity that became popularized um, in the Scandinavian countries. And what you can see here is that the upper body is doing a technique that is somewhat similar to cross-country skiing and your lower body, you're just walking and you're walking on sidewalks, roads, as these two ladies are here, um, or trails. And you can see it really takes your walking into a, a high intensity um, exercise. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to talk to you about is what are the benefits of Nordic walking for rehabilitation, particularly for people with MS? And I'm just going to do a, a comparison to walking alone first. Uh, basically, in this photo, what you'll see is that when you're walking, you're primarily using your lower extremity muscles. Uh, next slide. But when you're using walking poles, you're actually using to 75 to 90 percent of your muscles, and it really focuses on your core muscles. Your core muscles are important in terms of ability to transfer, ability to walk, and with every step that you take, you apply a downward force on the ledge of the handle, and that results in contractions happening in your abs. So what uh, it's been really helpful in terms of the walking poles is that you do have support on both sides of your body through the two poles. And that has been really helpful for times when you experience dizziness or fatigue. It's helped uh, people to reduce um, or to help to prevent falls. It, it, you, doing Nordic walking is actually exactly the same rhythm as regular walking. It's opposite arm and leg, and the, the poles help to propel you forward. So they propel you forward in a nice, fluid, coordinated movement, and it's excellent for walking because it is the same pattern, and it just helps to normalize that walking pattern, um, and just what Stephen was mentioning in terms of uh, keeping your opposite arm and walking pattern as functional as possible is really one of the keys for rehabilitation. Uh, because you've got that bilateral support too, people also say that they can walk further, they have more confidence for walking, and they tend to exercise more. Next slide, please. So here's a few testimonials. And this is, I obtained this one from a blog article from 2005 from Pam, who has MS. And she really talks about how the polls present the image of ability versus disability, which we've heard from a lot of people that compared to other devices such as canes or walkers, there sometimes is a negative connotation associated with decline, whereas walking poles, a lot of people associate those with um, 
hiking poles and and sports, so it's perceived as being more of an exercise equipment. And Pam writes here, walking poles not only improve my stability by providing essentially two more legs, but also engage my upper body and arms to help move me along, dramatically improving how far I can walk. I routinely walk over two miles around my neighborhood in about 40 minutes. No one who sees me hustling along with my poles can tell I've got a neuromuscular disorder and would be in a gelatinous heap on the ground without them. I look like anyone else out there walking, running, or biking to stay in shape. Next slide, please. And we also have a testimonial here from Leanne Carmel from Ottawa. So Leanne wrote us to us and said that the polls really helped her to remain active. She was a very active person. Um, prior to having MS, she wanted to continue on uh, with doing uh, travel and hiking, and she's written here, could not have walked all over Provence, France without my activator poles. I'm not letting MS limit me. And Leanne wrote that what she found the poles were really helpful for was walking on uneven ground. It really helped her to um, to prevent falls as well. She found that she can she could walk further to be able to do a lot of the day hikes that were included in her trip and um, she just felt more confident as well. Next slide, please. So in the webinar today, we're going to briefly go over the research. There's actually 280 independent studies on PubMed, and we've got 10 studies currently happening on the activator polls. I'm gonna talk about those studies more related to neurological conditions. Uh, then Dr. Cantor is going to talk about his treatment approach. He's going to review some sitting, seated and standing exercises. Then I'm going to uh, talk about how to do the techniques. First of all, I'll talk about the urban polling slash Nordic walking technique for people who have more mild symptoms, the activator technique for stability and balance. We'll go over some contraindications. Uh, where you can get resources, and at the end, we'll leave time for questions and answers. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, in terms of the research, there is 280 studies on PubMed. There's actually 19 on Parkinson's. Um, there's presently none on MS, so I'm going to focus more on the ones on Parkinson's and stroke. And as I mentioned earlier, there are 10 current ones on the activator polls. You can see a summary of a lot of these current studies on our website, urbanpolling.com, under research. Or you can go to PubMed and just put in the keyword Nordic walking. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there is no, there isn't any studies that have been completed on MS. However, I was excited to see that um, there is one happening currently in Spain. It's on endurance and walking training by Nordic Walking in MS. And the reason why this was uh, studied is that the author written, has written here that walking capacity is one of the most valuable body functions among persons with MS and is one of the most frequently affected even in early stages of the disease. Inactivity, inactivity and deconditioning can accelerate gait impairment and promote other pathologics related to sedentary lifestyle. So hopefully that study is going to be done sometime in 2020. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there is a lot of studies on Parkinson's. Uh, this one is a, is a randomized control study. And basically, there were three different groups. There was one group that uh, did walking. There was one group that did balance and flexibility exercises. And there was one group that did Nordic walking. And what they found was that all the participants improved in terms of reduced balance, improved uh, reduce, sorry, reduce pain, improved balance, and improved quality of life. However, Nordic walking was superior to the other groups in terms of improving posture stability, stride length, gait pattern, and gait variability. Next slide, please. And I'm just going to show you a video 
of a woman who has Parkinson's disease. And you can see on the one side, very little arm swing, shuffling gait pattern, short stride. And when she's using the poles, there is a lot of arm swing. She's got a bigger leg stride. She's actually lifting up her knees and she's doing more of a heel toe gait pattern, which you can see very clearly when she comes down the hallway. You can actually see the base of her feet there. Next slide, please. There's also been a study that has been done on stroke. Uh, because of the contralateral movement of the poles, very similar to walking with lots of arm swing, was the justification for doing the study. And what they found was that gait balance and activities of daily living improved more significantly in the Nordic walking treadmill group. So I should mention a couple things. First of all, when I say gait, I mean walking uh, or mobility. And second of all, even though this study I have included because they compared Nordic walking to walking, we normally don't say use a treadmill with the Nordic walking poles um, just because it does require more coordination, more concentration. And I think that could be a bit challenging on a treadmill. In this particular study, they were one-to-one uh, -one supervision and assistance with the therapist, which wouldn't often be the case for um, people doing Nordic walking on a continual basis. Next slide, please. As you know, uh, sometimes depression and decreased mood are part of MS. And here's a couple studies that were done uh, with mental health units. One found that increased patients' physical activity improved their mood. And in this bottom study, which was done primarily with women, um, age 32 to 50, what they found was that overall it did improve mood, less fatigue, decreased depression and anger compared to walking alone. And for this reason in Canada, uh, the polls are used in uh, mental health clinics um, quite a bit. Next slide, please. And what I'd like to do is show you this video that was done for the Xeno walkway, which is a mat that has sensors. And this is Barbara. She doesn't have a neurological disorder, but she does have uh, issues with balance and falls. She's 88 years old. And you can see she's got a very wide walking pattern. She's walking slowly. She's really swinging out her arms because she's worried she's going to fall. And she's walking quite flat footed. So um, with a shuffling gait pattern, that's being shown in the green and white foot patterns on top there. And that figure eight is showing that there's a lot of gait variability. And gait variability is associated with an increased risk for falls. Whereas in the next slide, we actually have Barbara walking here with poles. And you can see right away, it's increased her leg stride. She's actually lifting up her feet and doing more of a heel toe gait pattern. Um, her, her stance isn't as wide and her arm swing is more normalized. She's walking faster and the figure eight is showing um, that there's a lot less gait variability in her walking pattern. And I'll just mention too, in terms of why I'm so focused on the shuffling gait pattern, um, as an occupational therapist, fall prevention is something that uh, is really important to us. And one of the reasons why people do fall a lot is because they tend to walk quite flat footed and then their feet can tend to catch on uneven surfaces or side cracks in the sidewalks or changes in the rugs. And a lot of people, when we first started testing them with poles, told us that because they've got the bilateral support, they tended to lift up their knees and do more of a heel-toe pattern. Next slide, please. So in the next slide, we're just doing a comparison. And I can just let you know that increased gait speed by about 37% and increased stride length was about 62%. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna bring it back to uh, Dr. Stephen Cantor to talk to you about treatment approaches.
Thank you, Mandy. So, as we spoke about in the introduction to tonight's webinar, and as Mandy brought up in these case presentations and using the gate mat, the importance of balance to prevent falls, to improve gait, is something that must be considered with all people with MS who have any type of mobility limitation. Now, patients may be very used to working with a physical therapist or occupational therapist who does exercises to improve their proprioception or exercises that may be done with eyes closed um, or exercises with head turning. And when those exercises are done, those are addressing the sensory components of balance, which are definitely important. You'll see that I'm gonna also speak about the balance strategies, which are the motor component, component excuse me. And if you look at the, the diagram on the right, the neurologic system is pretty straightforward. It's probably understated by, uh, uh, overstated by saying it's simple, but you have a sensory system which sends information from the body. So it can be the hands or the feet or the legs to the brain. The brain then interprets what's going on and then it sends a signal back down to the body for a motor or a muscle response of some sort. Now this happens very quickly and to prevent falls, this must happen very, very quickly. And people with MS may have a conduction block. So the signal sent to the brain may be delayed and or the signal sent back to the muscles can be delayed due to the MS. And what a rehab professional, such as a physical therapist or occupational therapist, will do during neuro rehab or a physical wellness professional. They could be a personal trainer or someone who, who uh, uh, engages on different activities for balance and, and, and walking. What they will do is try to stimulate a neuroplastic response, which may allow the body to reroute these signals around those bad signals, uh, or those delayed signals. So you can think of a road that's closed and maybe there's a secondary road that could be taken to accomplish uh, the task of traveling to the brain or back to the body. So when we consider the sensory components, that's only part of it. What I don't see a lot of physical therapists incorporating from the early stages of balance training are those balance strategies, which I'm gonna spend more time on tonight going over with you on different exercises where the ankles, the hips, taking steps are all absolutely necessary to prevent falls. Many people with MS unfortunately start their fall prevention by sticking their arms out, which is a natural protective reflex, except people with MS do this before they're even falling. They put their hands against the walls, they put their hands on furniture, they walk like a mummy and uh, or a zombie, and then all of a sudden, they're wondering why they have difficulty with their balance system. It's because their hands are sending those signals to the brain that we would like the legs to do that. So by incorporating the activator poles into an aggressive balance training program, we should be able to take this away um, or at least decrease that, that abnormal reaching out. So the way that, that we think about activated poles being incorporated, for rehab programs for people with MS is to increase weight bearing activities. And by increasing those weight bearing activities, as I indicated, we can get increased neuroplastic changes because when we're standing, there are a series of muscles that are working. It's not just one muscle, there's many muscles. And when we consider standing and walking, you know, ultimately, if we think of a muscle working, just strengthening a muscle or moving a joint will not overall allow for better balance or better walking. The analogy I commonly use is that if you gave me a trumpet and I blew into the trumpet and pushed down all the buttons, I would make a sound, but I'm not making music. Making music requires a certain sequencing and that's what's needed for neuroplastic changes to have a, a beneficial effect. And I believe this starts with weight bearing, standing activities. 
Now, weight-bearing activities do not necessarily need to be just for people with balance issues. They could be for people who don't have um, any major walking limitations. They can, people who have uh, MS um, of 4.0 on the EDSS scale, which indicates walking is not a, a primary limitation, they can benefit from weight-bearing activities as well. This may be a patient who has neurogenic fatigue. They can walk, but their walking gets tired after 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Using activator poles can help that. And then we, if we go to the other side of, of, of the spectrum of the EDSS scale, the patients who are sort of stuck in a wheelchair all day, these are patients on people who can stand up and may benefit from standing up so they can take a couple of steps to get to the toilet or take a couple of steps within their house to be able to perform a basic function that they want to be able to do. So if we consider the fact that this is not just for people who want to walk better, this is for the whole balance system, we can consider that the balance of standing can benefit anybody. And standing is, is again, the most important aspect of, of what I'm talking about here. Now, another reason I use activator poles is to improve walking. Now, again, there are some people with MS who aren't able to walk. I'm gonna spend a little time on talking about the people who are having difficulty with walking, primarily because the balance system is not at the level that it's needed to be able to walk um, safely. And the concern is that this patient population with MS starts to decondition simply because they're fearful of walking. They don't wanna walk because they're not sure they can walk well. Patients with MS who don't want to walk will get deconditioned and which will create an increased risk of falling. And this can all be prevented, in my opinion, by incorporating more standing exercises, more walking exercises with an appropriate modality. In this case, we're talking about the activator poles. And as I will speak about in my exercises and Mandy will, speak about later on regarding the technique, this is different than using a cane because um, this is not about just giving an assistive device. This is not something that's supposed to make you look disabled. These poles can ultimately help recover function that otherwise would have been lost. Sorry about that. So I mentioned before the idea of starting neuromotor exercises early and getting balance tra training at the early part of uh, um, a neuromotor program for people with MS. And I, I repeat again, the fear of falling or patients who think they may fall are the ones who need to be addressed right away on a, uh, uh, an aggressive balance program, which can start with just standing and weight shifting. It doesn't have to be um, anything too aggressive that's, that causes fear in and of itself. Now, as you'll see from the exercises I'm gonna show you, these are not exercises such as standing on one foot for 30 seconds or closing your eyes and putting your feet together. To me, those are not appropriate exercises for improvement in balance with the purpose of improving mobility. So you're not gonna see that tonight, but we wanna make sure that patients with MS do not become fearful that they're gonna fall and then stop walking or standing. Plus, patients with MS may have that nerve conduction issue that causes them to be fatigued early on, and then they feel like they can only walk a certain distance. By using the activator poles, what can happen is a patient will be more confident in walking longer, even if they have to rest for a little bit. And if they get overheated, they're not going to be fearful that they're gonna, their legs are going to give out on them because they will be able to utilize their arms in a functional way that won't create an abnormal response and will allow for those normal uh, uh, lower extremity, the leg strategies, which the therapist should be working on to improve the ankles and then the hips and then the ability to take a step if you happen to lose your balance way before the hands reach out. And when you use the activator poles, you will hopefully learn how to incorporate the activator poles in fall prevention as well. But the main goal is really to get those legs working so they are able to shift weight and function um, in, in, a, in, a, in a more normal pattern. And we talk about weight shifting because ultimately the idea of, of moving your body in different directions is what 
will make the difference between you being confident in functioning and and being fearful, which again is what I work with most of my patients to avoid, avoid being fearful. So I wanna spend a, a minute or so talking about this idea of weight shifting and what it means, because for the patients with MS who are listening to this, or even clinicians, as a reminder, you know, we wanna make sure that our patients do understand that um, we're not having to move in an abstract way in any random direction. Even though life is, is random, we still wanna have some structure to the exercises. And if you see on the left, there's the, the blue, green, and, and an orange picture. And those are the three uh, cardinal directions that we work on, um, twisting and rotating being one, side to side, almost like you're leaning to your side um, each way, and then forward and backwards, obviously, are the, uh, is another direction that you have to weight shift to be able to function. And this happens with our trunk and our core, as well as our legs. Now, as I indicated before, we want to do exercises with people who are not able to stand easily. So those patients with a higher EDSS, 7.5 or 8.0, there are exercises that can and should be done sitting as well. And we'll show some examples of exercises with the activator pole, activator poles that you can do that. But also understand people with MS who commonly um, don't stand up and walk because they can't do it easily. I'm hoping that now you'll incorporate exercises to teach you to stand up better, but that standing up better and sitting down correctly requires a good weight shift. So if you look at this picture, hopefully you can appreciate the fact that this uh, man's center of gravity, which let's consider the center of gravity, the middle of our body, right where our belly button is. And for this person to actually stand up, he needs to lean forward. Okay, there's a lot more to it, but for the sake of, of what we're talking about now and weight shifting, this person needs to lean forward. And the first exercise in A, the, the one marked A, to me is a great exercise just to start with, just being comfortable with leaning forward. B, you can see by leaning forward, he's able to actually put weight into his feet and start standing up. I can tell you that if a person, anyone with MS or not, does not lean forward, they're gonna have a difficult time standing up. And then C, the person, the young man here is standing up. Now, you should appreciate the arrow, which is not shown here. The arrow for standing up is actually pointing backwards. When he's standing up, if he stood up too quickly, he actually may fall backwards. All of these weight shifts need to be addressed just with the function of sitting to standing and then being able to tolerate standing. So these are a, a list of exercises that I commonly prescribe with people with MS. Um, all of these exercises when prescribed, I tell patients and explain that they should be performed in a safe area. Um, I obviously practice this during a physical therapy session with them before they take it home with them. There are always risks of falling with any standing exercises, regardless of uh, the type of MS or how bad the MS is. So you wanna make sure it's a safe area without distractions. And you also wanna make sure that this is done um, with the, the physical therapist or occupational therapist or trainer who can go over these with you. Now, this is a long list. So I don't expect patients who are on this webinar to, to, to look at this and say, I need to do all of these. That, that's not even what I prescribe. I may prescribe two or three of these along with two or three stretches. Now I show the patient the exercises and I also provide the exercises uh, to be seen on, a, on a, uh, an app called PT Connect or PT Helper. Um, now I don't work for PT Helper. I don't work for urban polling. Um, I'm, I'm just a proponent of um, both the product, the activator polls, which is why I'm speaking to everyone tonight, but also um, the app that uh, the PT Connect and PT Helper, they have these exercises that I've developed so you can see them easily if you sign up, which I think it's for free, but maybe it's $2. It's nothing extreme um, as, as far as I know. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some of these exercises um, that are now bolded for you to see. I'll explain why I prescribe them and show you what they look like um, as I, as I uh, practice them with a patient and what they look like on the PT Connect. 
So the purpose of each of these exercises goes back to that weight shift. How can we get a person who is standing to not lose their balance? And as you may remember, the first strategy the body needs to use is that ankle strategy. And that's what I work on with up on toes, up on heels. Then the forward backward weight shift exercise that I commonly prescribe focuses on that next strategy, the hip strategy. And as you will see, it also even starts to look like as if a person's walking a little bit. So it teaches them how to, how to almost shift their weight from their back leg to the front leg with walking. So it's what, what's called in, in the PT and OT world as a, a part to whole task. You, uh, you're training part of the bigger task. And sometimes patients who take those short narrow steps, similar to some of the stuff that Mandy showed in the video, they may start using more energy for walking because they're not taking a big enough step. Sometimes they can't do it because they don't feel comfortable. The next exercise I'll show is a three o'clock, nine o'clock exercise. This one is to teach patients how to turn safely. Too often I see patients have their feet too close together or they cross their feet over and that is a problem. And when a person turns in the wrong direction or twist in the wrong way, what will happen is their ankles won't be able to function and their hip will have to work to prevent the fall. And if that doesn't work, they'll need to take a step. Unfortunately, if you cross your feet over each other, taking a step becomes dangerous. So this exercise tries to train a patient how to make sure that they can weight shift while they're turning. And the last one here that I'll show is called wide feet slow marches, which as you'll see is exactly as it looks. And it really is to focus on the weight shifting element from side to side, which is needed for walking and needed for balance uh, strategies to work most effectively. As you may uh, see later when I show the video, this is similar to standing on one foot, but instead of standing on one foot for 30 seconds, which makes no sense to me, this will be standing on one foot for two to three seconds and controlling uh, the uh, to the other foot for two to three seconds so that you can work on that skill. So let's start with the first exercise. And this is what it would look like on the PT Helper and PT Connect app. It's the same thing, just two names. And this, uh, the way it look will show these individual pictures and it'll go sequential. So you can review it over and over again. There are videos on there as well. The video I'm going to show you is not the video that is on there. However, you should be able to appreciate, um, you know, on PT Helper, it's the same thing. So let's start on the left. You'll, you'll, you can see that the patient here, her, her left hand is on the sink. It's flat. It's not grabbing onto the sink. We don't want to grab on because we don't want the hand to send that signal to the brain. And this one, again, you're going on the toes for about three seconds, you're resting for about three seconds, and you're on the heels. And this is what the body would need to do if it were losing its balance forward or backward. And on the right, you're seeing the same thing, on the toes, rest, and on the heels. So there's a level of power that's used by the muscles. So we're actually strengthening muscles, we're stretching the joints, but the main purpose of this is to be able to shift the body weight forward and backward without holding on with our hand tightly. Now, with the activator poles, you'll see on the left, the person has to, this patient has to work a little harder. So she's doing all the same work. She's keeping her shoulders up, the feet are apart, and she's using the activator poles for support. Now, because the, the part of the hand that's pushing down on the activator pole is by the pinky side. Um, I call it the hypothenar area, that's very technical, but the pinky side is pushing down. The brain is not gonna get too much information from that versus if, the, if she was using a cane, there would be a lot of information sent to the brain from the hand, and that's not what we're looking for. Again, another reason why I like the activator poles. Now, if you lose your balance, the activator poles can help with preventing that as well. So I have her exaggerating what can be done. Um, and this is something I do train my patients as well. So the next exercise is called forward and backward weight shift. Again, here's the PT Connect, PT Helper uh, sequential pictures that show each step of doing this. 
and here it is um, in a video. And I do have my patients take videos like this all the time in the office. Uh, so sometimes they remember what was taught. You could see in this, I have her closing her fist. If she doesn't want to have her hand flat and can't stop the urge from grabbing, I may have her use a closed fist. Again, it takes away from her grabbing and using the palm of her hand, which sends the wrong signals to the brain. As you can see in this picture, the knees are straight, chest upright, shoulders level, and getting a good weight shift. And the side benefit is if the ankles can lift up, um, as, as is shown here, um, that would be a side benefit. But if it doesn't happen because of a foot drop, that's okay as well. Do the best you can. And with the activator poles, you can see here getting that weight shift. And this patient just happened to have uh, pants with a nice uh, orange and blue line. So you could see the knee being straight and then the weight shift forward, making that line perpendicular to the floor. Um, she's doing a great job, those feet apart, getting the weight shift up, getting the ankles moving. So you could see there's more than one muscle going with this exercise. The neuromotor exercise, three o'clock, nine o'clock, is something that I think is so important for people who tend to not want to turn or lose their balance when turning either 90 degrees or turning around 180 degrees. So the focus of this exercise is for the patients not to cross their legs. So if they're turning to the right, you start with the right. If you're turning to the left, you start with the left. And the whole time the feet stay apart, to permit for a better weight shift. Here again, to make sure she's safe, um, she has her hands near the sink. I have her challenging herself a little more by hovering the hands. That's not required. More often than not, I'll tell patients to keep their hand flat. Just do not grab tightly because that will take away from the exercise. If you need to grab tightly, that is fine because we do want the exercise to be safe. With the activator poles, they can be safe as well because the poles are there to address any issues you may have with the weight shifting. So here, she's timing out these steps sequentially. There are some patients who I may have the activator poles move first before the steps. And then the ones who have advanced, I may even have go faster like you see here. Now, what you may or may not have seen is she starts to look down as she goes faster, and she's looking for more of that sensory feedback, which if I were uh, a good PT, I would have told her to keep her head looking forward. And the last exercise I want to show here, I'm just going to show it uh, right from the video from the start, is wide feet, slow marches. And the key to this is that the feet are really wide apart, shifting the weight to the right and to the left, controlling the descent the lowering of that leg, because if, if the leg just plops down, then that's not, um, that's not a good level of control. Now, for people who have a foot drop and possibly a hip drop, that weakness in the hip that doesn't allow them to lift up, then do the best you can to lift up, um, even if it's a little bit. It, this does not have to be as symmetrical as this. The key is trying to keep those shoulders level and trying to keep the feet apart and doing the best you can not to grab too tight. But of all these exercises, this is the one I do let patients grab a little tighter. And here with the activator poles, the same exercises, okay? She chose to put the poles a little bit out to the side. You can move them a little forward. Um, so you see that exercise being done here. But what she told me doing this exercise is she felt her core working a lot more than when she was doing it in front of the kitchen sink. So we talked before about people who are sitting and want to get standing or people who are uh, in wheelchairs who can exercise. And the activator poles can be used for more than just the weight bearing components. So here it's used in other ways to create weight shifting forward and backward, side to side, use targets such as the different colored um, dots on the floor. So it can be incorporated into a cognitive exercise. Um, but in this case, a lot of weight shifting, a lot of flexibility being shown here. I love this exercise. Here, again, not that you can't use other poles to do this, but this is part of an overall grouping of exercises that can be done. So rowing is a nice exercise that can be done, as you saw on the left. And then on the right here, 
you could see that weight shift. Oh, I love that weight shift. And then you enhance the exercise by creating a posture stretch so that the chest can open up. And by having the, the hands down um, and being able to use the poles, it allows for some um, increased ability to get a better stretch that's a little bit more focused. And then he, again here, targeted twisting. Targeted twisting. It could be done as shown here, or it could be done with a cognitive component where you could have someone tell you a color, and then you have to re either remember where the color is or go or go and look for it and then make that twisting. And then here, other sitting exercises that can be done. And she still is putting weight through her hand so the core can be engaged. Otherwise, to me, this is great for general mobility. This in and of itself will not help with balance, in my opinion, um, but is a good exercise to get joints moving and incorporate the idea of, of other things that can be done with the activator poles um, itself. This particular one, you may be able to think about getting in and out of a bathtub. Um, and instead of having a grab bar, having these poles, not that you would use it in the bathtub, but you can see that there's a, a similar mobility and will incorporate those same muscles. This is an exercise I've told Mandy before that I really love. And if you look at this exercise, think to yourself, what is this trying to achieve? Now, part of it you may say is, uh, uh, resistance exercise, I see it as part of the arm swing with walking. Now this exercise is a little bit more of a range of motion exercise and coordination exercise, uh, which uh, again can be integrated. Now, if you weren't with your therapist, you could do this with a family member or a friend, and it's something that obviously looks enjoyable to do. So I appreciate again, everyone, uh, taking that time tonight to listen to uh, myself present with Mandy about the activator polls. Again, I, I've really, really uh, enjoyed working uh, with uh, the activator polls and incorporating them into the home exercise programs and uh, on site clinical uh, programs that I have for my patients. And here's my contact information if you'd like to ask any questions or follow up regarding this, uh, 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 the exercises I, I, I showed. Um, and thank you again, and I'll pass it back to Mandy to go over some of the techniques related to the Nordic uh, poles and the activated poles. Oh, thank you, Dr. Cantor, for a great presentation and some very practical exercises. Uh, so what I um, would like to talk about in this slide is that in Canada, we have seen a change where the activator poles have been used as an effective option to canes and to help to delay or reduce the use of walkers. So I just want to mention, I think the walker is an excellent tool for stability. There's certainly uh, times absolutely when it is the best uh, device for a person to be using, but I just want to go over some of the challenges associated with it and when possibly people could reduce or delay the use of the walker. So as you can see this fellow in the middle here, um, when you're using a walker, people tend to walk with a very rounded back, uh, looking down rather than keeping your, um, your head up to improve overall balance. There is virtually no arm swing. When you are using a walker, you are keeping your arms in a very stationary position. I can't help thinking that's why some older adults do have shoulder issues as well. Uh, there's not a lot of room for your leg stride, so it tends to shorten up your leg stride. Um, and if I had you do an exercise right now where you stood up and leaned on the desk or table where you're watching this laptop and leaned on it as if you're leaning on a walker, what I think you, what you would notice is that you actually relax your core muscles. So in terms of um, mobilizing or walking where you're, uh, or exercising where you're strengthening your core muscles, when you're using your walker and leaning on it, you're actually relaxing those muscles. Uh, re reduces your speed and sometimes the walker can be um, cumbersome to use for public transit or smaller spaces. And then on the other side here, I have um, my boyfriend Brad Pitt here demonstrating how to use a cane now that he's available. 
And you can see here he's leaning to one side, so that's affecting his posture. Uh, it's changing his arm swing. He's leaning on the cane with his wrist in a hyperextend position, putting a lot of force. Like Dr. Kendra was saying, a lot of a sensory stim is happening um, to, the, um, to the hand joint in that position. Uh, whereas when you are using walking poles, you are forced to stand more in an upright position, opposite arm and leg with a lot of arm swing increasing that leg stride that we saw earlier. So if you are presently using a walker, um, you will need to be assessed by a therapist to determine whether you would be a good candidate to try out the activator poles. And you will also need a treatment to improve your balance and your core strengthening in order to utilize the activator as your a daily or primary walking tool. So your therapist may decide that you are that you may be a good candidate to use the activator poles doing rehabilitation or as a fitness or daily exercise tool, but that you should continue on using your walker more for um, stability and balance as your primary walking device. Uh, same with the cane too as well. So um, yeah, so the best would be to discuss it uh, with your therapist if you already use a cane or if you um, if your therapist thinks that you need a walker or you're presently using a walker. Next slide, please. So here is just a video showing the difference with uh, using the activator poles versus the walker. And you can see the stoop posture, the short stride, uh, and uh, how much she's leaning on that pole in terms of um, the use of her core muscles. Much more arm swing, bigger stride, and faster speed with the poles. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about the two different techniques that you can utilize when you're walking with the poles. So if you have mild symptoms and you really want to use the poles for getting a good core workout, for um, a nice long arm swing, for really increasing your speed, for overall fitness, still getting that bilateral balance, then you probably uh, could start off with the urban polling or the Nordic walking technique. And in this particular technique, it's really more uh, similar to the, the fitness exercise in which you keep your arms out nice and straight. You can see in the picture here, the, the woman and the fell almost are looking like they're out giving you a friendly handshake with a straight arm. And at the same time, the pole is on a diagonal. And when it's on that diagonal, it's able to propel you forward uh, with much faster speed and with a nice fluid movement. And what you may be able to see in the very base of the pole as well, there is a boot shaped tip and that actually should be facing backwards. That is going to propel you forward as well. Okay, and if you want to see the technique, you can go on our website at urbanpolling.com under getting started and it will be called the urban polling technique. Uh, on the next slide, what I'd like to do is show you how to do the activator technique. So this is really a technique that you would do um, when you want to have more balance and stability. And in this particular technique, your elbows are bent at a 90 degree angle. And the reason why they're bent is that that allows you to keep the pole vertical. We had a study done at University of Western Ontario, and what they found is that when you want to use the poles for balance and stability or offloading off your hips and knee joints, it's best to keep the pole vertical. And you also can see the video on our website under Getting Started, and it'll be called the Activator Training. So again, the main difference is elbows are bent. You're still a lot of movement from your shoulders. You're lifting and planting that pole in a vertical position about the same distance as the front foot, the opposite arm and the front foot, as you can see in the photo here. Next slide, please. I should just mention, though, that 
For some MS clients, I have found they will use both techniques even within the same session. So I've mentioned earlier that sometimes if you've got more mild symptoms, you might do the urban polling technique. And if you are using it more for stability and balance or instead of other devices such as canes or to reduce the use of walkers, you might use the activator technique. However, there's no hard and fast rule. And as I said, I've seen some clients who've told me that initially when they're starting, they're just starting to warm up. They might use the activator technique, then they'll get going. They want to go a little bit faster. They want to get a bit more of a workout. They'll switch over to the urban pulling technique. And then once they're starting to feel more fatigued and they want to cool down, they'll do the activator. So uh, I think it would be very helpful to actually learn both and use the technique depending on what your needs are. And of course, with the discussion with your therapist in terms of what she feels would be safer and more effective. Okay, so uh, the other thing I found is that um, if someone is teaching you the technique, you, you might uh, want to remind them to not use a lot of instructions while they're trying to teach you. I know that, you know, it's a lot of new learning. You might want to really focus on um, or, or concentrate on those steps. So I find sometimes less instruction is better for people with MS. Don't worry so much about opposite arm and leg. That is something that's going to come natural. That's what you subconsciously do when you're walking is that you walk with opposite arm and leg. And I find the less you're thinking about that, the more likely that you're going to do it. And it's something that's just going to come naturally. Sometimes people are learning and they say they're, they're getting really frustrated and I find that's because they're focusing too much on opposite arm and leg, which, as I mentioned, is just something that will come in time. Next slide, please. So just talk to you a little bit about how we change the features uh, for rehabilitation and for balance and stability. So um, as Stephen mentioned, the whole idea is that we develop the ergonomic handle. We call it the core grip. So it keeps your wrist in a nice neutral position. You're putting all the weight on your the pinky side of your hand. And um, it's got a ledge there. That ledge is what you're going to push down. So you're going to put a downward force through it for the core strengthening and the offloading. So when people first start learning, I find they use a really tight grip. You want to actually loosen up that grip because that puts less pressure through your hand. And you want to actually put more of the force going downwards through the ledge. Okay, uh, we also made it strapless for safety and to reduce the risk of injury. Next slide, please. Um, what there was a study that was done by Dr. Knobloch in Germany in 2006 on Nordic walking, and what the, he found is that Nordic walking is safe uh, amongst the general po population. Most injuries occur during a fall or when the pole gets caught, when the user is still attached to the pole, so through the strap, and the highest rate of injury is the skier's thumb. So usually, generally, when you have a pole with a strap, you put your hand through the strap, and then you press down on the strap. So um, your wrist can sometimes be in a extended position, whereas, as we showed you earlier, we wanted to keep that wrist more and the hand more in an ergonomic position with the force coming more through the pinky side of your hand. And we had Dr. Knobloch look at the poles and he agreed that uh, he felt that with this design being strapless, uh, that their rate of injury may be less. Next slide, please. The other thing that we changed is that I found when I initially brought poles from all over the world, that a lot of people with limited grip strength found it difficult to do a turning lock system. Um, and then the therapist wouldn't know that it would be secure unless it was tightly gripped. So we actually changed the activator to a button lock system, which means that once the button is out in the lock, it's secure. It actually holds up to 200 pounds per pole versus some of the um, there are some low quality poles. And I always cringe when I hear therapists say just go to Walmart or Costco. Um, because for some of those poles, the weight bearing capacity can be as low as 40 pounds, which means that if you are leaning on the poles for balance or instead of a cane, 
um, the pole may slide down. Okay, so there are other good types as well. Just make sure it's got good weight bearing capacity. We also changed it to a bell shaped tip that you would use more for the activator technique. You can also put the boot shaped tip on the activator as well, but it comes with that bell shaped tip. Um, so that keeps that pull more in that vertical position. When you pull it off, there is a carbide steel tip that you can use for trails, for snow, for sand. Um, so you can allows you to do those activities and also make sure make sure that the pole doesn't slide uh, in those uh, slippery terrain. There are three anti vibration features on the pole as well because it is a repetitive task and it's something that you would use on sidewalks and roads. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are some contraindications and precautions? Uh, definitely that you should uh, be looking at under the direction of a licensed therapist. So again, if you are currently a walker user or if someone, if your therapist thinks that you need a walker, uh, as well if you're using a cane, and again, the therapist may decide that you should continue to use that walker as your primary device, but perhaps you can use walking poles for exercise or during rehab sessions. Um, you really want to uh, make sure that you're aware of how far you can go and um, exercise good judgment on utilizing walking poles. Sometimes I find people get walking poles, they go uh, too far and they get too fatigued. Um, usually a general rule is go start off using walking poles about 30% of your maximum walking tolerance because you are using more muscles. There's more concentration required because of the new learning and the coordination initially. So that may be more fatiguing as well. So start off about 30% and that is a, a, a safe distance to go when you start and then gradually increase your time over time. Okay, so during relapse where fatigue and dizz dizziness is significant, that may be times that your therapist may suggest that you actually use poles. But if you're already using poles for balance uh, to help manage with your fatigue and dizziness, during times of relapse, it may be better suited for you to use a walker during those time periods and then go back to the walking poles um, when that relapse has ended. Next slide, please. And here's just to show you how the poles can be used in group exercise programs. And these um, felt this is a mix of people with Parkinson's and um, MS. You can see the poles really give people confidence to do large movements, um, bigger range of motion uh, movements as well. Uh, more confidence because they've got that bilateral stability and it's just it's just fun it's a lot of fun to uh, have a different device to use for exercises and you can see it's uh, it's holding the fellows up with really nice posture as well then they are stepping to the side for a side lunge next slide please and it's uh, great to add them to walking programs as well. So if you've got a walking program that's already occurring, uh, maybe you can talk to uh, your therapist about utilizing the poles during that program. And um, this also provides a great way to uh, obtain social support as well. And Carol writes here, challenging but a wonderful experience to connect with people experiencing the same struggles. Next slide, please. So in summary, we covered the research on neurological conditions. Uh, Dr. Steve Cantor gave a fantastic presentation on his treatment approach, how he uses the poles with uh, standing exercises, and then we sh showed some seated exercises as well. Uh, we talked about two different techniques, so the urban polling or Nordic walking a technique for mild symptoms, and then the activator technique for stability and balance, contraindications, and I showed you some examples of uh, some group exercise programs or when it can be added to walking programs.
So next slide, please. So we'll just open it up now to questions. But sorry, uh, just before we do that, how to access access more information, you can go to urbanpooling.com. There's research. There's the videos on the techniques. There's lots of other free webinars on Parkinson's and strokes. And to order the activator polls, you can get them through Amazon as well as our website, urbanpolling.com. Here's our telephone number or our email address. And with this webinar, we will be giving a 25% off coupon code, which is called Active25. And we'll be sending you an email with this recording and with information about the resources and how to um, order the polls as well. So now on the next slide, we will open it up to questions and answers. So I'll read out the questions and I'll get Dr. Cantor to answer them for us. So Dr. Cantor, someone's got here, why couldn't I just use my hiking poles instead of uh, Nordic walking or activator poles? Good question. Um, I, and I do have patients who come in with different types of hiking poles um, that they use from time to time or the ones that they use all of the time. And then when I introduce them to the activator poles, they immediately immediately notice the difference because of that, that lip where the pinky side of your hand is able to rest on. And that ledge, like you showed, the technique by using the ledge increases that uh, core contraction, which doesn't happen with, with the hiking poles. And I didn't even realize it right away even when I learned about the product, but when patients would say, wow, this really is different, even though so many parts of it look similar, that's when I tell patients, that's the reason why the activator pulse should be used for the exercises. Patients who use the hiking sticks already for walking, often I'll let them stay with it if they're comfortable with it and, and they've been functional with it. But for the exercises, um, I'll insist that they use the activator poles or just do it at the kitchen sink, but I would not want them to do it with the hiking poles. Oh, thank you. Um, another person has asked, if I'm using a walker, can I use the activator poles? Well, as you alluded to, Mandy, and, and what is true is, is that if, if you have a walker or a rollator um, to get around you know, to, to, to walk around the house, you may need that because of your balance. However, there are many patients who I will integrate those balance exercises that I showed you during this webinar. People who use a walker or a rollator, I will have them do all the balance exercises with the activator. And the goal is to be able to wean people off the walker. So hopefully they'll either start to be able to walk with the activator poles or with other types of assistive devices so they can get away from the walker for, for, regular, uh, for regular walking. So the answer is you shouldn't use the activator poles for walking instead of the walker, unless that's what your therapist recommends. But you should ask to see if you can incorporate them into a balance training program like I showed you. Thank you. And then uh, finally, we've got one last question. It said, what was the inspiration for the activator polls? Oh, so I will answer that one. It um, Well, basically, it was my Swedish neighbor that introduced me to the concept of Nordic walking and uh, where the it is a fitness activity there that I'd mentioned earlier is a really part of their culture and used by people of all different ages and fitness levels. And then when I looked at the research and I brought it to different focus groups, what I found is that people really enjoyed utilizing the polls. They, um, they, a lot of people talked about um, almost feeling just, uh, you know, a, a sense of relief with using them and that they were just a lot of fun. They were enjoyable. They could see, a lot of people could see the outcomes, you know, quite immediately. And from that, we just went on to look at how do we change the design so it's a little bit, uh, it's more safer and effective for rehabilitation. So thank you so much for asking. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time, especially during this very uh, challenging health crisis. Uh, I just want to say if anyone is uh, has been watching and is working on the front line, uh, we, I certainly appreciate your dedication and time. And also, I really would like to thank Dr. Stephen Cantor, Cantor for an excellent presentation. Uh, he also did one for healthcare professionals that you can um, actually uh, find the recording on our website as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending out an email with the recording and the contact information for myself or Dr. Cantor. So if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. So thank you so much, everyone, and I hope you take care.